And just the first one, you know, to reduce the economic and institutional barriers between humans and their habitat. So everything that he's done is based around um, trying to help humans live within nature versus sort of recreate nature as we do to try and live um, better and different. It's using nature and taking advantage of nature, uh, just like you know, all the houses that, uh, that we, we have when they're built, they funnel water away from the house. But in the earth ships, water is funneled toward the house and then captured for, for use. So it's sort of taking advantage of what nature has to offer, making use of the sun, making use of, of the ground. Um, Earthship sort of design principles. These are the things that sort of drive all these buildings, but they use natural or repurposed materials. So taking materials out of landfills keeping them out of landfills. They use so solar heating, thermal heating and cooling, um, using solar and wind electricity, harvesting water uh, that is really used then four different ways. Now, one of the big issues uh, with water and it being a, a scarcity or, or will be, uh, the typical human and, you know, and living here and, and probably down south where you are, Emily, uh, uses 75 to 80 gallons of water per day per person. But in the earth ship, we use more like 20 to 25 gallons of water a day per person. Uh, one, we're trying to conserve, but uh, two, water gets used in four different ways. You know, we use it uh, in, in the sink to, to wash or in the shower. And the water goes into a gray water system where it feeds the plants that we have uh, that are inside the house. And the water gets filtered um, and then gets reused as gray water to flush the toilet. And so that's its third use. And then it goes out and uh, into a septic system and then is used to take care of the landscaping outside. So it's used four different ways. Um, contained sewage treatment, again, uh, you know, the, the septic system and food production. Those are sort of the principles. Um, and, and the way that the earth ships are designed um, are to take care of all of a person or a family's basic needs, um, access to food, um, shelter, including heat, and cooling, clean water, energy, garbage management, and sewage treatment. And um, we're gonna go through a few of the details, not in a lot of detail, but um, try to get some of the frequently asked questions taken care of. And um, I'll start with food since that's sort of my department. I'm the buyer of food, the cooker of food, and I love to eat food. Uh, that picture on the left is actually um, a harvest, I believe it's from the Earthship Biotecture Visitor Center that has an exterior greenhouse, uh, very similar to what you see on the right hand side. Um, every Earthship either has an interior planter, like our house, a lot of the older homes have an interior planter, but um, the newer designs actually are built and designed to um, maximize the amount of food a family could grow. Um, year round in, in the desert, which is, well, that alone is kind of interesting. Uh, shelter, you know, one of the human needs is shelter. And uh, so the houses are designed to take care of that human need in a way that takes care of, of humans. Um, you see the planter, this is the one in our house with the banana trees uh, growing, but you, you have the, uh, the windows facing south um, you see that middle picture shows uh, the sun in, in, in the summer, the sun is up very high. And so the house is sheltered from the sun and in the shade. In the winter with the sun lower, the sun, the sunlight and the heat comes in through the windows and heats up the house. See that bottom right-hand picture that is just a, a, a beige blob. 
that's really just one of our walls. The walls are, are rammed tires, tires rammed with earth. Uh, so a tire that weighs maybe 15 pounds becomes about a 400 pound tire. Um, but the walls, that's what the walls are made of with a, adobe or plaster on the outside. Um, but they are the thermal mass that as soon as the temperature in the room is higher than the walls, than the temperature of the walls, the walls absorb heat. Uh, and so in the winter, you let all the light in uh, and all the heat in, the walls heat. And as soon as the temperature is colder outside and the temperature in the room drops below the temperature of the walls, the walls start to give off heat. And so there's the, the thermal mass and the thermal heating that happens. And um, our Earthship doesn't perform as well as the newer ones, but generally temperatures stay between about 66 and 74. Um, very comfortable. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna freeze. We're not gonna overheat. Um, in the newer Earth ships, they've even designed, you see on the lower left, um, that's, those are just the pipes that typically go under culverts and streets. Um, those uh, pipes bring cold air into the Earth ship and through a convection system and just physics, uh, draw cool air from the ground through the pipes and uh, heat goes out the top, really creating air conditioning. And uh, the picture you see in the center there um, on the bottom um, with that dirty dish rag, sorry, um, <laughs> hanging over the faucet is called a hopper window. Um, those windows that you see that face the whole south side of the house are generally inoperable. They're, they're stationary, but there's this little hopper window over the kitchen sink that's almost like um, like a thermostat. Um, you can use the blinds on the windows and that little hopper window and the skylight that you see at the top right to um, almost serve as like a form of convection to get warm air out of the room, cool air into the room, um, and to keep the um, keep the house surprisingly comfortable. Um, I was a little skeptical. Um, I'm a girl who likes my air conditioning, but there were very few days this summer where I felt like the house was too humid. Um, it might have been a little warmer than the 70 that I like in the summer, but um, they are surprisingly comfortable. And just by working the tools you have, the shades, the hopper, the, the skylights, um, they are, the house is absolutely surprisingly comfortable. Clean water, one of our needs. Um, and and it, again, it's, uh, you know, we, we collect water. There's a, our roof. We collect water from, from snow and, and uh, rain. Um, it collects down. You can see it going into the, the top of our cistern. Um, uh, uh, that white plastic thing is, is a cistern. Ours is actually made from rammed earth tires because it's older. The newer ones, they're using 1,750 gallon uh, cisterns, putting two or four in a house, but we all collect rainwater. Again, there's no, um, you know, there's no electricity coming into the community. There are no electrical wires. There's no sewage. There's no um, water lines coming into the community. Everybody collects their water on, on their roof, uh, stores it in a cistern, and then brings it back into the house through the item that's on the right. It's called a, a WOM, W-O-M, Water Organizing Module. But similar to uh, to a well, uh, you know, it, there's pumps, there's filters, special filters for drinking water, so that uh, the water gets to uh, where we need it. <clears throat> Energy again, a, a big need, and we all have to charge our computers and our phones and uh, run lights. And uh, this is uh, on our, our roof, our solar array, um, the solar panels that if it snows, I got to go up there and, and uh, brush them off. 
<clears throat> but the power comes into a, a POM, P-O-M, a power organizing module um, that has charge controllers and all the circuit breakers and, <clears throat> and an inverter to change the power that goes into the batteries from DC to AC. Um, you see the lower right, um, it's just an insulated box on the roof that holds the batteries, uh, very well insulated. And uh, the display on a charge controller, we're constantly um, watching that to make sure that we have enough power. You know, there's 300 days of sun a year in, in the Taos area. So there's always good power, but if you get two or three cloudy days in a row, um, you really have to be a little conservative. Well, and, and that too, that, that little green screen there is sort of the heartbeat of the house. Um, Especially when we first, um, when we first um, moved there um, and to answer Emily's question, um, we didn't really know a lot about solar power. Jeff had watched a lot of YouTube videos and read a lot of stuff. Um, and I guess we thought we knew more than maybe we did or understood, but um, that's sort of the heartbeat of the house. We know how many volts are coming in. We know how many volts are going out. Um, we know that at around 11.8 volts, um, the batteries are, um, are working too hard and will wear out quicker. And so um, we've learned a lot about different appliances and the kind of tax they make on the batteries. Um, a flat iron, as you can see from my beautiful not straw-like hair, um, I augment my beauty with a flat iron. <laughs> if I'm not doing that, my hair looks like a, a, a lot of straw. Um, the first time we plugged in that, that flat iron, um, that power just went <clears throat> down. Um, I'm a quilter. So the iron, the electric iron is something that um, takes a lot of power. I um, only use it during the day. I can only use it during the day. I, I do it at the sunniest time of the day so that I'm using power as power is coming in. Um, but once we have, our, we have our power, or at least our inverter set um, for AC power, that um, once we hit about 11.8, um, it shuts down to kind of save itself. It goes into conservation mode and we are limited to a few lights that are, um, are hardwired. Um, for, to, for, for DC. For DC, for direct current. So yes, Ben, um, we store. We store the power and it's, it's totally off grid. So whatever power we make, um, you know, we need to, to, to store it. So we have um, eight, eight batteries that, um, um, that and there's, we use. There's a concept called floating I want Jeff to explain too. Like we love it when our batteries are floating. They're literally not floating off the top of the roof, but explain that quickly since it's on there. Well, the, the batteries go through a, a cycle or the charge controller and charging the batteries in a bulk mode. And then uh, it, they get to about 95% full and they uh, slow down to sort of a, a trickle. The charge controller just trickles energy into the battery and that becomes absorbing mode. And when they're fully charged, the batteries go into a floating mode and uh, just stay charged through the day, of course, as soon as the sun's down, we're using power from the batteries and, um, you know, and then it's, it's going away, but the uh, solar array and the batteries are um, sized, we sized them in a way so that we could have about three days of, of cloudy weather in a row. Uh, and not run out of power, we should be fine. Yeah, and to further answer Emily's question, um, a lot of, um, I will say I haven't learned the physics and the science nearly as well as Jeff. Jeff has become um, very knowledgeable, but um, a lot of what we, we learned in the beginning was just by making mistakes, like that one night where, where the, the night the lights went out, basically, <laughs> and we had a romantic night of camping without much power, but, um, uh, it's, it's a learning experience. And one thing too about being in the community um, is that everybody else who lives in the greater world, and especially because we live in a higher density neighborhood where the houses literally are like 
just right by right beside each other or right across from each other there's always someone who's smarter than you that you can ask and um, the names of people who are brilliant in solar and brilliant in plumbing kind of get floated around the community so um, you never really are out there whipping in the wind you right. always have help and, and the people there are so generous with what they know especially if you're kind of green literally green but yeah uh, garbage management you know uh, keeping things out of landfills is uh, you know one of the one of the things that we really need to do as a society find ways to to manage garbage and and so um, you know you can see you can see here how cans and bottles have been used to to make walls and it's really it's really art um, you know here's some some other things upcycled garbage uh, you can you can see um, you know the community brings all their bottles and I don't know how many get so many bottles but we drink a lot yeah I don't know. maybe yeah. we drink a lot not quite sure <laughs> a lot of a lot of beer bottles and wine bottles that uh, get collected and and that we end up uh, can, cutting and using as part of walls you see in the middle there are tires and that's a a, a a tire wall as somebody's house was being was being built the tires are in full with with rammed earth, um, and you'll see me later um, uh, using a sledgehammer to put earth into tires, uh, but uh, it really makes strong walls and a strong foundation that is uh, earthquake proof, fireproof, um, and, and creates that, that thermal mass. Uh, also on, on the left, uh, community compost, and we do a, a lot of composting most uh, and nobody has garbage disposals uh, so we compost everything and create good dirt then for the greenhouses and our planters and to um you'll notice that um yeah we live where lots of hippies and artists live um and lots of people who are super sustainable like we're probably the least sustainable people because we have a house somewhere else but um like garbage is made into everything uh that that picture on the lower right hand side with that adobe wall and the clear glass that's the you'll see a better picture of it later illuminated at night but that's the wall above our bathroom door and um our kitchen and um you know it's, that's pretty basic but that um that thing on the right with the green bottles on the top is some sort of like pillar, um, like for a gate for someone's house. Um, it's going to be interesting yard art. And yes, it does kind of look like coronavirus, Emily. <laughs> sort of does. Maybe that was inspired. But um, what you see to the right there, those little like fish scales of different colors, those are pieces of sheet metal from discarded car doors and um, junkyards and appliances. You see that harvest gold and that avocado from like mom's kitchen. Um, those are actually just used as like decorative tiles um, to, uh, to uh, or shingles embellish. On roofs. Or shingles on roofs or like we showed earlier, the scales are the feathers on the phoenix. And Jeff explained that, that um, so, wall. Well, that's a, that's a, a, a bottle wall, like an, an outside uh, wall fence being built. Uh, it's just in the building process and I'll show you what it will look like, what it'll look like later. Uh, sewage treatment, again, you know, a, a human need. And as I said, there's no, there are no sewers. Um, and, and so everything's done uh, just, just like uh, out in, in the country in a septic system. Uh, but the septic system and the black water is, is the fourth sort of use of water. Um, the runoff from the septic system is then used in a, a leach field you see on the left and that feeds the, the landscape and some people actually have black water um, tank, tanks that uh, they grow additional food. There is some food you can grow in black water. Um, melons, for example, grown in black water have no more or less uh, bacteria than 
um, what's grown out in typical fields and you know where, wherever melons are grown. And um, it's wonderful for watering the trees or the shrubs in your landscape, the flowers, um, basically anything that grows on a tree or on a stalk, uh, they say, and they've tested, can be safely grown if you use black water. Um, it's good for the plants, it's good for the environment, um, eliminates waste. Um, and we're not watering a lush green lawn or anything like that. But as you'll see when we do the house tour, we are very fortunate to have a, a lot of landscaping and um, we're not wasting water. We're getting that fourth use out of the water that way. Uh, this is a picture of the entrance to our neighborhood. As we mentioned earlier, it's called the Greater World Earthship Community. Um, and looking at the artwork and um, all of the stickers that seem to be on every stop sign. Um, yes, lots of artists and lots of hippies <laughs> like us, I guess, live out there. But for the most part, it's just um, a lot of people, very diverse as far as interests and backgrounds um, who just want to do their bit to live sustainably. Well, this is our house. This is our Earthship by Eaton a Share, uh, Eagle House. Um, you see the solar panels, the, the windows that we talked about. This is the middle of the summer. So during the day, we have the, uh, the shades down to keep the sun out. Uh, to the on the, the left hand side is uh, is solar hot water heater um, that provides the, the hot water that we need at least if you tried to take a, a shower at uh, full hot water at four in the afternoon or five in the in the afternoon you probably scald yourself uh, but um, you know it's still fine in the morning and um, you know it, it it, it works. So this is uh, this is a, a picture of the front of the house, and I, I think I, I mentioned that the front of the house is different than what we all think out here. Um, the road is goes along the back of the house, and the front of the house is is this. So it's sort of opposite. There's an overhead uh, picture, Google Earth picture of part of the greater world. Um, this is the part that's called the gravel pit. We live in a hole in the ground uh, made of garbage in a gravel pit. And it's not just for moles. I highlighted where our, our house is. This is the high density area of, of uh, the greater world. It's an old reclaimed gravel pit. Uh, there's more houses now. This was, uh, I think, a Google Earth shot from a couple of years ago. This is us doing the naming of the house. We waited for the girls to be there in November. So I, I broke a, we broke a champagne bottle, not on the house. We didn't want the glass all over, but so we named it by eating a share. Uh, and yes, more than a tear or two was shed by at, at the, the sacrifice of all that champagne by some of our children. <laughs> uh, we tried to, to, you know, make it a Jewish home. We put up the mezuzah. Um, and it was fine, I think, but Solomon had to recheck it. She had to double check. Um, all right, things that we know you're curious about. Um, so we, we tried to picture some of the things that you may be curious about. Um, and um, those items that you see there may or may not be how we handle some of the activities of daily living, but we'll give you a little snapshot there. We do have a refrigerator. It's very well insulated. It can run on DC power or on, uh, we run it mostly on LP gas. Um, we do have a shower and a tub and a regular toilet. It's not a composting toilet. <laughs> uh, no, we didn't use the, I broke that bottle. I, I, I couldn't then cut it up. Um, so. But we did recycle the glass. Yes. <laughs> 
Um, we do have, uh, yeah, it, it uses, the toilet uses gray water. So it's water that was being reused. It's already run through the planter and, and been filtered by the plants uh, and another filtration system. Uh, but it is not a composting toilet. Um, we don't have to go out to the outhouse house. We don't have a hole in the ground. Um, we know that there's some solar ovens that are, are used to take care of uh, poop, uh, but no, it's, it's the real thing. And also too, um, a question a lot of people have is like, okay, you're using gray water to flush your toilets. Does it smell? Does it look dirty? Uh, no, actually the gray water doesn't really have a particular odor. Um, it's generally, some, sometimes it looks like totally crystal clear, like you don't even know you're doing gray water, but um, it all depends if we've done a lot of cooking or um, certain foods um, that are a little stinkier, like broccoli or cabbage or things like that sometimes have a little bit of, of an odor, but it's certainly not unpleasant and there's not bits and pieces of food or whatever in the, the water. It's just um, it's water like flushes a toilet. So, so we, we do have a, a stove and again, we're running a stove off of LP gas. Um, we have a washer and dryer, uh, rarely use the dryer um, because particularly in the summer, if you take your clothes and put them on a, on a clothesline for 10, 15 minutes, um, they'll, they'll be dry in, in the high altitude and low humidity. Yeah. It just doesn't take long. You got to be careful that you don't leave them out there more than 15 minutes or they'll, they'll burn. Yeah, literally the first time I used the wash line, I'm so used to everything taking a really long time here. And I mean, and I know from being in Taos in the past that you could hang things on the balcony at your condo or wherever you were renting and things would dry quickly. But um, I left some, um, some lingerie, like, you know, things with a lot of elastic in it and literally fried the elastic in my Spanx in about a half an hour. So we now set the timer to go out and get things off the wash line because um, those banks are expensive. <laughs> uh, real lights, um, you know, real lamps, uh, AC power, some things are DC, uh, but uh, so real lights, uh, real real sinks and, and water and um, you know, uh, drinking, drinking water that's specially filtered. <clears throat> and, and of course, there's the off-grid kind of chores. I don't have to worry about, uh, about mowing the lawn. I don't have to, I don't have to shovel the driveway, uh, but I do have to shovel the windows uh, just to make sure that we get the, the sun coming in uh, so it heats up the, the thermal mass of the house, the floors and the walls. Um, so you see me shoveling shoveling the windows or uh, I have to go on the roof and, and brush off the solar panels to make sure that we're getting power. Uh, that picture on the, uh, on the right, um, you know, the, no, no garbage disposal. <coughs> and um, so all of the water from, from the sink, from the kitchen sink goes into the gray water cell and so you have to have some kind of filter to make sure that you filter out any particles. And we try and do that in the sink, but seems things always get through. Uh, that is a, a, a nylon pantyhose, uh, you know, knee high, whatever pantyhose uh, that we use as a, a filter and it filters all of the, uh, the garbage, so to speak, coming from the sink and it's got to be changed and it's a nasty job every two three weeks depending how much we're cooking um, to change that uh, gross it is gross uh, but there's also a whole lot of beauty out there um, you see the rainbow and you can maybe see slightly a double rainbow over the top of our house um, but uh, you know the mountains in summer the mountains in winter a very, very beautiful place. 
I know uh, some, something almost everyone has <laughs> been curious about that, you know, I, I, that I've known or people, people that um, have heard about this are like, oh, show me pictures of the inside of your house. So um, this is what it would look like if you're driving down um, <laughs> out right off Earthship Way, one of the main drags and down South Lemuria, which is our street. You'll see the backs of the houses all covered in dirt in these earthen berms with like these weird dragon tails sticking out. Um, this is um, kind of the back of the anthills. Um, the fronts of the house would have the windows. Um, you get to see all like the weird, uh, the wind turbines and the satellite dishes and all of that. So you'll be coming up to, uh, to our house here. And just uh, so welcome. Welcome to Bite and a Share. Um, you're back to our friends now. So we'll just take you in uh, the back garage or by the, by the garage doors there, but we'll take you in uh, uh, into the front later. Um, one, of the, one of the key parts, especially in the early days of building earthships was using reclaimed materials, um, upcycling materials. Um, we were very fortunate that the second owner of the home um, also really loved the home and also loved gardening in their retirement. So we we're very blessed to have some deciduous trees and some beautiful shrubs um, and even have a bench made by one of our former owners out of um, reclaimed, I'm guessing railroad ties or, or some kind of wood. And if you look above the number seven in our back door, that's actually a coffee can that has been rusted and punched to look like copper. Um, it is absolutely beautiful when, when it's shining on at night. Is the, <clears throat> the back of the house uh, along the street uh, what doors to what was once a garage that we've made into a bedroom? Uh, but you know you can see uh, uh, up above on top of the house uh, an open one of our open skylights, um, the berm on the house that's really packed up against the walls of the house for insulation, about 15, 20 feet worth. And what uh, was at one time, and maybe again, a, a wind turbine on top of the house is uh, <clears throat> near the front door. Uh, again, reclaimed, recycled wood, um, that wood pallets that were made into a, a bench. You can see the uh, typical New Mexico um, <clears throat> Latias on, on top of the, the porch, the port, portal. Um, there's uh, just basically uh, branches and uh, that round structure is, is this, the side of the house is uh, where our cistern is. And you can see a, a bottle brick wall. <clears throat> um, this is what you would see um, well, from the opposite view, but this is the... Um... Oh, yes, Emily, it's funny because I always say the same thing, that those latias um, out on the portal are like a built-in sukkah. All you have to do is this kind of put in the sides. So maybe we'll be there during Sukkot next year. Um, this is uh, our front like entry that. to our home. Um, <clears throat> get a little bit of a view of um, our yard outside, the angle of the windows. Um, our planter, which right now is mostly ground cover and some some banana trees that are a little past their prime. Here in the house, look. <laughs> but mm -hmm. you can see that little closet there that has the two little doors. That is actually made out of reclaimed wood, and that houses the pump that does the recirculation underneath of the water in our planter. And uh, my probably one of my favorite things in the house is that bench. Um, Jeff actually made that bench. We bought a piece of, um, of wood from um, urban wood, which is reclaimed wood from cutting down trees and parks, et cetera, in uh, Milwaukee. And um, Jeff finished that and made a, a bench out of it. This Ooh. is uh, <clears throat> sort of looking into the living room, but you can see uh, Rita's um, treadle sewing machine. It's a 1919 Singer model. Um, <clears throat> she hasn't used it yet, but it's it's ready to go. I think she's going to get lots of exercise uh, <laughs> moving that that foot pedal. Leg day. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a, a view of our, our living room or a great room. Um, one of the 
one of the ideas that we had when we talked about how we maybe furnish this space was we wanted to make the smallest possible environmental footprint, uh, especially since we have um, a second home, which is, is you know, less than eco-conscious to have two of everything. So we started first with, with furnishings that we had um, from years past, just stored in our basement, things that we weren't using. We figured that was the best way to avoid waste. Um, did a lot of thrifting, um, lots of consignment stores, um, a little bit of Ikea um, of their sustainable items at Ikea and, um, and a few things that were new, but almost everything has, um, it has a history. Um, that lamp, for example, was the best free thing we ever picked up. We happened to be at a consignment store looking for lamps. There was a lamp in the back corner, all dusty and without a shade. And we asked how much it was. And the woman at the store said, oh, why don't you just take it? We can't find a shade for it. Um, it's useless to us here. Just get it out of the way. We don't have room to store it. And so a trip to the Habitat Restore later found us a shade. And I think it's one of the prettiest things we have in our living room. It's for uh, about 50 cents, I got this. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a, a little snapshot of our um, of our dining area and it gives you a good view of the bamboo floor. Um, we have um, large sheets of bamboo that make the flooring and you get a, a little bit of a view here of the, um, the adobe. Um, anything you see that's that lighter beige is actually adobe. It's not painted. That's the color of the earth. And if you look at it very closely in the sunlight, you can see little flecks almost of gold. That's the micaceous clay. That's um, part of the, the, the dirt that's um, here in the, in the gravel pit. So they literally took dirt from the gravel pit and stuck it to the walls. And um, you see bits of straw and, um, it, you know, it just, that's very much part of the earth. And then where you see the orange is where the wall has been repaired and, and painted. Yeah. Just a, a view uh, out, the, <clears throat> out the window, the backyard and, and the kitchen. Um, okay. Here's the kitchen, uh, re reclaimed uh, wood countertop. Uh, on one side, uh, sort of concrete and flagstone on the other side by the sink. Um, you see the use of recycled woods in the cabinets. Uh, we even used old Coke crates down there at the bottom for spices. The cabinets, again, windows and countertops. You see the banana, the banana trees that aren't producing, the baby ones and the old ones. Um, I, one of the things, uh, you know, particularly during the winter, uh, with all the sunlight coming in, uh, just growing herbs. We haven't planted them in the planter yet. We're still top watering them, uh, but we'll see. Uh, some things do very well in gray water, uh, others, Others don't. Oh, and to answer Ben, your question that the smaller refrigerator freezer is due to power consumption. Yes, actually. And um, unlike the TARDIS, if you're Doctor Who fans, it is not larger on the inside. Um, it is super insulated. Um, we have a very small refrigerator space, but um, it's super insulated and um, um, uses less power that way. It's um, still about 11, 11 cubic feet, so it's not... It's not tiny. Yeah. Um, our neighbor actually has one that's underneath the counter, almost like you'd see in Europe. And um, theirs, theirs is tiny. Um, we, you know, we do have a lot of the things that any kitchen would have. You know, we have a stove, we have a refrigerator, we have sinks, we have hot, run, hot and cold running water. Um, what you generally won't see in an Earthship kitchen are... Um, power consumptive appliances, um, particularly things with heating elements. Um, most do not have a microwave. They require a lot of power. Plus, you know, if you're, you know, out there in the earth, throwing microwaves out isn't a popular item. Although people who want them um, and, and can, um, you know, have the power for them, they, they will use them. It's rare. Um, we don't have a dishwasher. 
Um, we have Jeff, who helps with the dishwashing. Um, and we generally don't have a lot of things with heating elements. Um, for example, um, instead of a coffee maker or a tea maker, we use the tea kettle and the French press. Um, Jeff likes to use that giant jar there. We throw some water and some tea bags in it. And by afternoon, especially in the summer, um, we have hot tea or we have iced tea. Um, generally don't have garbage disposals, although some homes now um, are building those into the plumbing. Um, we use a compost jar instead. Um, but what we're finding, oh yes, and the Instant Pot. Um, the first thing I bought for the house was an Instant Pot. I was so excited because it's like, oh, I'm not gonna spend much time cooking. I'm just gonna let the Instant Pot do it. And then you're like, no, the Instant Pot's gonna use all our electricity for the whole day. Um, and you can't use it when it's dark. Um, so we actually have a pressure uh, pressure cooker. So on old fashioned. an old fashioned pine with that thing that jiggles and makes scary noises. And um, so far we've survived. Yeah, well, here's just uh, you know, a picture of the bathroom and the, uh, the kind of nice curtain that, that Rita made. Um, and also the the door into the bathroom, but you can see up above the, uh, the bottle wall and the light coming through, very, very pretty. Um, again, this uh, bathroom, this is the bedroom, uh, a couple of different angles that we created um, <clears throat> out of what was was their the garage that somebody had created. Um, another, uh, <clears throat> you see the skylight that's open uh, in the bedroom and uh, kind of a, a sitting area that uh, those are ottomans. Um, that you can sit on in the bedroom area, but they also fold out into, into uh, cots, into nice, nice beds. Um, I get I get the the special. We don't have a TV in our bedroom. TVs use lots of power. Um, we do have a TV and uh, a VCR, a VCR DVD player, and a stereo in our living room. But um, one thing we don't have is a TV in our bedroom. So that skylight, since it's by my side of the bed, is the TV. And uh, because we have so many clear days in Taos and we're out in the middle of nowhere where there's no light pollution, um, people love stargazing. Um, it's very common for people to have great big telescopes, but you can just stand outside and see things from the naked eye. Or if you're lucky like me and your part of the bed is under the skylight, you can watch the moon go by, you can see the stars, um, you can hear the baby coyote <laughs> the neighborhood baby coyote howl um, is actually quite beautiful. Uh, the whole month of November, um, I was out there and I took the Earthship Academy. It's a, a, a class uh, every day, uh, Monday through Friday, all, uh, even Thanksgiving Day, uh, all November. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in the morning, we had uh, lectures and and theory about you know um, thermal heating and how to build earth ships in the afternoon uh, construction skills and helping to construct earth ships and these are some of the projects that I worked on you can see me pounding tires as that's not me pounding tires over there but where the foot is and the sledgehammer trying to keep from hitting my foot uh, but filling those those tires up and you know, standing there with my tools, getting uh, getting ready to go out. Um, I helped with uh, uh, with septic systems. Um, you see that that wall again, that uh, bottle and can wall, that eventually looks like this in the upper left hand corner, uh, going around the house. Let's see where I was cutting tires um, down down, or sorry, cutting uh, bottles down below. I helped lay flagstones in a in inside an earth ship um, by the the greenhouse, and over here on the right is um, called a, a salad bowl. It actually is. It is a salad bowl. It is a salad bowl <laughs> that they cut out the center, and and uh, you know, to the left is the edge of the gutter that the water is. Then when it rains, pouring down at the salad bowl and it's going down into the cistern. 
Um, and this is, this is our last slide, but um, we do get those 300 plus days of sun. And um, at the times when you can have those, um, those shades open, especially in the winter time, um, there is nothing more wonderful than just feeling the warmth of the sun. And um, the person, I guess, or the family member who gets to take advantage of it most is our, our dog Finnegan, um, who just follows the sun all over the house and um, is really enjoying being a, a city dog out in the desert. Yeah, so go ahead and, and ask us anything. You've been asking questions all along and tried to answer them, but uh, I guess, you know, un, unmute yourself uh, and ask a question. Anything, ask us anything. Nothing's too weird, embarrassing or personal. Well, I don't know. What kind of building codes do they have? Uh, uh, there, there are some. There's still plumbing codes. There's still plumbing inspections and uh -huh. uh, and electrical inspections. Uh, some people, at least in the early days, totally ignored them because they're out here in the middle of nowhere, doing what they want. But um, but but really, there's uh, all the all the typical inspections, mm -hmm. special permissions for how water gets used and, and reused. And, uh, you know, you don't say that you're just, you know, reusing water, you're, you're talking about how you're filtering it and refiltering it okay. more so than what happens in uh, a sewage system in a city. Mm -hmm. Also too, um, if anyone is curious um, about this, uh, that, that, that film Garbage Warrior, the documentary they made, I think it was made in about 2012 or so. Um, so it's a little old, actually sort of documents Mike Reynolds' struggle to get permission to build these kinds of houses and the kinds of legal battles that he went through um, in terms of building codes and um, all of the obstacles that were like put up in his way and um, if that, that actually answers a lot of the questions. And I think if you asked Mike Reynolds um, what he thought of the building codes, you'd just say, you know, there are suggestions. Um, oh, Mark, yes, Mark says, Mark has seen it. He said it's an interesting film. Um, but yeah, that, that answers a lot of the questions too about kind of the struggle to get permission to build this sort of wacky way out there. Mm -hmm. Jeff, if you could um, take the screen share down, maybe we can all see each other now and ask questions. Absolutely. Mike, uh, I'm curious how much time you're spending there. Uh, I, I spent the last seven and a half weeks there. Rita was back and forth a couple of times. Um, we'll probably end up spending about maybe three to four months a year with, you know, uh, driving back and forth. It's a 20 hour drive. So it's not like driving the uh, four or five hours up to your, your cabin, but, um, but, but it's nice. It, it's nice out there. And again, it's just like, a, you know, it's like a summer home for us uh, at this point. Yeah. And the time we spend, it won't be three or four months all in one big time span. It will be, you know, like the equivalent of three to four months. Um, being out there, well, I will admit that being out there for a long time, like rather than just a week or 10 days, uh, being out there a long time was just wonderful. Um, you kind of get that Taos vibe and you don't want to come home to all the other stuff that's going on here. But my mom is um, 93 and is living in Racine, so um, we can't be gone for terribly long periods of time. Emily, there's uh, about 50, 55 houses in the community right now. Um, and it can probably handle another 30 to 40 houses. Um, it's just a large acreage that borders the uh, Bureau of Land Management land in the near the Carson National Forest. How much land do you have? We, we have just a little bit under an acre. Uh, many of the... Many of the lots are, are, are much bigger, three to four acres. And they're all, um, you know, we're in this higher density area, but all around the community, the, the, the lots are created, they're round. They're not square lots that everybody's adjoining. There's space left in between 
lots for wildlife to, to go through, for people to walk through, uh, so that you're not always abutting people's property. And to the grocery store. Uh, about 10, 11 miles to the grocery store. It's, it's really just outside of, of Taos, about 10, 10, 11 miles. Are there other? Oh, what are there other? Go ahead. Okay. One of the treats of going to the grocery store is like on a 25 minute drive or whatever to get to the, to get all the way down through town um, is getting to um, on each part of the trip, drive over the Rio Grande Gorge Bridge, which is um, beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. In case, or in the, unless you're Maxana, Maxana covers her eyes and just says, drive faster, drive faster. <laughs> but the rest of us just love it. It never gets old. Now, go ahead, Esther. Um, I forgot what I was going to ask. It doesn't matter. Um, let's just take maybe two or three more questions and uh, so the people who are there full time, I mean, do they work someplace or is it like it takes more effort to live that way and so that takes up your time or no, what, they, they, what do people work, do? They, they work, they're just sort of normal jobs, you know, architects or, uh, you know, working in coffee bars or uh, a, a, a woman who owns a, a gift shop in town. So just, just sort of normal, normal everyday things. And really the amount of effort it takes to live in these houses, once you get the kind of the feel for things, um, you do have to interact with it a little bit more than maybe another house. You have to remember to turn the pump on or you have to, you know, shovel the windows if, um, or the solar panels if there's snow or what have you. But it's just kind of like living in a regular house. You forget that you're in a, you forget that you're in an off-grid house because it's so comfortable and everything's so convenient. I was just wondering, um, do people have children that live there? Oh, and if so, yeah. how old are they? And where do they go to school? Or what do they yeah, do? Absolutely. There's schools, you know, schools in Taos, uh, you know, 10 miles away. Um, yeah, they, they have kids. The kids have grown up there, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, kids that appreciate the living in an off-grid uh, community like that, and then some who are rebellious and don't like it, just like everywhere else. <laughs> Our neighbor, just a couple houses away, just told us when we were there in November, they're expecting twins. Ooh. So they're gonna be living in their one bedroom. Well, they're actually building a tiny home, but um, they're gonna be living with their twins in this small house. and. Um, at the very end of the street, there's a, a couple of teenage girls who've grown up there since they were infants. Um, their mom and dad are both architects. They both helped build a lot of these homes that are in our community. And they're like the hardcore um, earth sustainability people. They don't have a, like they, they only have their solar hot water. So if it's cloudy for four days in the winter time, they just take cold baths. Um, you know, they're, so you get people who are like really hardcore, you get people who are, um, you know, more casual about it and that's just where they live. Is there uh, anything? We have about, uh, someone asked a question, we have about, we have about uh, 11, 1200 square feet in the house. It was a really nice, nice size, one bedroom, one bath house. Is there anything you have to do when you leave, like shutting things down or keeping things on or? Um... We, we just we've been just leaving things on you know we could turn all the power off but uh, we keep things on and then someone comes over and uh, actually we had it automated so it run the gray water system every day so the gray water doesn't turn to black water um, and, and that really really takes care of it but I will I will I will say this because I don't think we said it in our presentation one of the hardest things to do when we leave is leave it clean uh, for the next time. So we, um, you know, we do all the wash or we, you know, we change all the beds, we um, clean the house um, because what we hope will happen and you're all invited is that anyone who wants to, you know, when you feel comfortable with traveling, venture down to Taos um, we're, you know, we're not renting it as an Airbnb or doing anything. We're just opening the house to anyone who wants to stay there. 
Uh, we leave the house clean for guests so that guests can come anytime. We have a house manual that explains all the scary knobs, dials, and screens. And uh, we leave instructions for how to leave it for the next guest. So um, you are all invited to come and stay at our home in Taos anytime you like. Just let us know and we'll put you on the calendar. That's a great way to bring closure. Thank you so much. I've learned an incredible amount. I'm sure we all have. This has been taped, although I missed the first 10 minutes. Thank you. Thing, but Thank it's you been so recorded. And um, I know there are others who probably want to want to hear it. Cool. Very cool. Very that great. You. That was really cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thanks for coming. Yeah. I'm thank so you. amazed, Rita, the way you cook with that size refrigerator freezer. I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, will, I know how I am. It's kind of horrible. Um, the whole the whole month of November, I had too much food in the fridge, and too much food in the freezer, and it was almost kind of like a burden to try to find places for things um because i knew we'd be there for a while and actually solomon <laughs> came down for um her school ended up their break started pretty early and they, they were just having kids do their their uh, finals online uh -huh. so she's actually staying until january 10th so i knew i could have a lot of food there um when we're there for a limited period of time i don't get quite as crazy about having a lot of food there but um yeah it was awful i won't lie um, the freezer is a mess. The fridge was a mess the whole time. Not, it's like Tetris to load the fridge. Okay, thank you all. Thank um, you. I'm not sure, Linda, do we have another Maven schedule? Hmm, good question. Well, well stay I'm tuned. Not sure. They're uh, being planned, but I don't think the uh, no, timing. I'm is there one with Dr. Schwimmer coming yes, up? Yes, I'm not sure of the date. Yeah, yeah there will be an update on the use of vaccines. Right. Oh, wow. um, Thank you, Rita. The Kreplach one we missed. So um, stay tuned. Watch for watch your email. Um, so we'll say good night and thank you good again, night. To Rita and Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Hope to see you all soon.